Hello humans, Halcylon here. The reason I'm here today is to teach you all that I can about combating Greedfall, which isn't a whole lot since I only played the game for uh, a little bit. I cannot do an in-depth tutorial just yet because that would require a lot more time and extensive testing of multiple playstyles. Initially I only planned to discuss the combat system, but there's not a whole lot I can say about that. However, there are many factors that can contribute to a fight, such as your talents, attributes and gear, and we will talk about those as well. To put it simply, today I share all that I know about the basics of combat from the perspective of a techie, so let us not dilly-dally any longer. The absolute first thing you must do in this game is tweak the settings to match your preferences. For example, in games like these, I prefer to dodge by pressing the spacebar. But oh wait, dodge is poorly labeled because when you're in battle, you don't dodge on this button. Oh no, that key is actually used to block attacks. You instead dodge with a sprint button, which I bound to my spacebar. This also means I have to hold this key when I run around. I also rebound the inventory key to tilde because I have short fingers and I is too far away from my movement keys. Mostly everything else is set on default. You attack with left click, parry with right, open the tactical pause with tab and lock onto enemies with middle mouse button. But if you've played this game for more than 5 minutes you already knew that. If you're on a controller, bad luck, you're on your own. I strictly cover keyboard and mouse gaming on the PC. When you start the game you'll have to customize the look of your character, which is irrelevant, and pick your skills, attributes and talents, which actually matter. I personally skilled in the technical fighting style, which uses guns, traps and bombs to control the battlefield and weaken enemies before I deal the killing blow with my sword. As you can see, the other three skills are locked out for me, and if I wanted to re-specialize in magic, for example, I would have to either waste important skill points into those abilities, or use a memory crystal to reassign my existing skill points. You get one such memory crystal when you leave Serene, the first town, so hold on to it until you're sure you want to change your build. But skills only determine your fighting style, which can further be improved by your gear. And the usage of gear entirely depends on your attributes. For example, endurance enables the use of heavier armors, while agility allows you to wield better swords. You can see that each attribute locks out certain pieces of gear, and you will be unable to have the best items in all of your slots. Choose wisely. Lastly, you have to choose one of the talents. These may seem confusing at first, and they don't have a direct impact in combat. These talents will be used in other gameplay areas, as well as offer different approaches to quests. For example, Intuition allows you to make an observation about a certain character and get him to help you, while Vigor allows you to scale difficult terrain towards a vantage point, where you can spy on that same character. The only talents that have some sort of influence on combat are Vigor, which allows you to regenerate your health in between fights, and Science, which is absolutely necessary if you're playing as a techie. Without this talent, you will have to pay others to craft the much-needed potions, bullets and poisons that you naturally burn through with this playstyle. There's no need to mention what each of these talents do, with the exception of Intuition. This one does help influence certain characters during quests, but it's also useful to highlight resource nodes as well as increase the amount of resources you collect, which makes it very useful for crafting. I recommend you to invest at least one point in Intuition if you have no gear that can boost it. Or you can become really good friends with Vasco and take him with you everywhere because his friendship perk is intuition. Yep, let me make this clear. Every companion you meet will boost one of your talents once you help them with their personal missions. Kurt's craftsmanship bonus is amazing. And as I've briefly mentioned, certain pieces of gear can also improve your talents. A cape will improve your charisma, while certain chest armor mods can boost your science, lockpicking or vigor. Before we start talking about combat, we need to briefly approach the subject of crafting. As I've said, you will naturally find crafting materials as you wander through the world, and these can be used either in smithing or alchemy. If you unlock either of these talents, you can build some things yourself at the crafting station, but if you chose to invest your talent points somewhere else, don't worry, you're not locked out of crafting. You can still mod your weapons and armor at the new Serene Blacksmith, and you can commission the Alchemist of Al Sad to craft you potions and chemical mixes, although doing that can quickly burn through your money. Maybe we can expand on this subject some other time, because doing so right now would deviate from the main subject, so let's talk about fighting. The in-game tutorial presented by Kurt is pretty good, but incomplete. This is where I come in. 
So, most encounters will have your party of three fight a few opponents at once, unless you are in a boss fight. That usually involves a single adversary, a very difficult one. But we won't talk about boss fights just yet, let's first survive regular enemies. Alright, first thing you need to know about a fight is this. Enemies have a short aggravation range. This means they won't travel too far from their spot and they won't chase you through the entire world. This can be good news, because you can disengage from a fight whenever you want, but it's mostly bad news because, if a fight with a group of hostiles takes you too far from their spot, they will lose aggro and reset the fight, instantly regenerating all their health. The really bad news is that your health will still be low and any bullets or potions you used in the fight are consumed for no reason. When a fight resets, you will see this eye icon briefly appear over your enemy's heads. That's actually a stealth indicator, which we'll talk about in a few moments. For now, let's stay focused on the subject. The engagement can end early, even if you push your enemies out of their zone, so keep that in mind. Alright, you engaged, and you remember not to get too far away from the fight. If you're like me, you're already dead, so reload. Oh, you're dead again. Relax, this is extreme difficulty after all. Dead. And again. You'll get the hang of it eventually. What, you think I'm very good at this game? Nah, I'm just good at understanding systems and abusing them. It's the only way I beat these games on their hardest difficulty. It's knowledge, not skill, that carries me through these experiences. Okay, point made, joke over. So how did I suddenly stop dying? As I've said earlier, by understanding the combat system. Let's pause. The tactical pause is what you will use mid-fight to take a breather, analyze your enemy's strengths and weaknesses, as well as plan out your next move. So now let's discuss all these things one by one. Analyzing your enemies, what does that mean? It means that when you pause, you will see which of these enemies use melee and which ones use guns, if you're fighting humans, so you can prioritize your targets. You'll also be able to see which damage types they can resist and what they're vulnerable towards. For example, this Nadaig Fersamen has 1% elemental resistance, 75% magic resistance, and 0% poison immunity. You'll get used to these icons in no time. Above his health bar you can also see some shield indicators. They represent your target's armor and all physical damage dealt by your sword and gun will barely scratch your opponent until you break his armor. Once that's done, his health pool will feel the full extent of your physical damage. All weapons have a physical damage stat and along that, an armor damage stat and a stun stat as well. We explained the first two already, but what does stun do? Well, the stun statistic on a weapon clashes with an armor balance stat represented by this icon. If an attack has a high stun percentage, it can knock down anyone whose balance stat is lower. For example, you can see in this tactical pause right here that my personal balance stat is 80%, while the Guardian's balance is over 3000. So how do we unbalance this bad boy? Uh, we don't. If he were a regular enemy, I'd just kick him in the face and knock him down, but bosses aren't meant to be stunned. The only time this feller's face touches the ground is when you kill him, and to do that, you have to whittle him down with elemental damage, poison and bullets. As a techie, I can deal those extra damage types with traps, anointed weapons or thrown files. Or you can just purchase a poisoned or elemental weapon and use that instead. And you can do that as any class. I haven't seen any imbued weapons in the stock of colonial merchants, but native traders sell these like they grow on trees. Who knows, maybe they do. When you look at an imbued weapon, you can see that elemental damage values are shown. That is the amount of bonus damage you will inflict with this weapon in addition to your physical damage. However, poisoned weapons don't have a shown damage value. Instead, they have a dosage statistic, which basically means that each hit with this weapon will add 3 seconds of poison on an enemy. While poisoned, you can see that this opponent's health constantly decreases while this timer is active. And if all that wasn't good enough, the extra effect of an imbued weapon can bypass armor. With all that said, a regular weapon still have more raw physical and armor damage. You can also use this tactical pause to carefully select an ability or potion to use mid-combat. It's a more elegant take on that thing you did in Skyrim where you'd pause the game, go to the inventory, scroll through all the food items and eat 200 cheese rolls during the fight with a dragon. But instead of pausing every time you want to use an ability, you can organize your top 12 abilities and potions into your quick bar to use them without interrupting the flow of combat. The interface explains this pretty well, but allow me to clarify. You pause, you select the ability you want to use, for example, firearms, you press middle mouse button on it and you select the quick bar slot you want it assigned to. 
Now, every time you press that key, you will shoot your gun. Simple. Do keep your health potions close to your fingers though. I always had my stim packs assigned to 4 in Fallout 4, so health pots go on the exact same key for me. You have more than health potions available to you, so don't be afraid to use them to turn the tide in battle. Now that we clarified all of that, let us unpause and continue the fight. You could absolutely just spam left click, but that would get you killed very quickly, so instead you will have to defend thyself, ruffian. You can dodge out of the way of an attack if you have the space, but it's even better if you can block attacks. Pressing right click makes your character do this, so you can just hold the block button and avoid all damage. Oh no 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 no. You actually have to time your defense, so just as an enemy launches his attack towards you, block. If you did that correctly, you successfully avoided taking damage. If you did that even more correctly, you stunned your opponent and dealt a bit of damage because that wasn't a block. It was a parry, and parries are what you should strive to perform at least against human opponents. You may also parry the strikes of regular beasts, but they're a lot more unpredictable and you'd have to get used to their moveset and react accordingly. Dodging works just fine against beasts though, so just do that instead. But what about boss fights? You can absolutely block their attacks and avoid pain, but you won't be able to unbalance or damage them with a parry, so trying to defend this way against the boss is a high risk, no reward scenario. I may be wrong here though, I've only survived two boss fights so far, so if you wanna try parrying them, go ahead. I won't stop you. But it's best to just dodge, bosses are slow and you can exploit an opening after they're done attacking. Before you engage in a boss fight though, it's best if you've leveled up a little and unlocked either the ability to dodge roll or perform a magic dodge. Lightning dash, I believe it's called. They're both done by double tapping spacebar and they'll get you out of a danger zone more reliably. For example, this is the result of a simple dodge. Dodge rolling out of that attack, however, saved my butt and allowed me to win the fight. There's one last thing I need to say about blocking. I tested it against a ranged attack and I managed to block a bullet. Simply pay attention to this sound. And when you hear that the weapon is locked, block and you should have successfully avoided damage. I also tested whether this works against magic bolts and indeed it does. Magic blasts however still kill me, but that may happen because I didn't time my block right. As you work hard to keep yourself alive, you will notice that each block and parry increases this bar. This is your adrenaline meter and when it fills up, you will be able to launch devastating fury attacks that have different effects depending on the weapon you're using. I'll let you discover these effects yourself, all I'll say is this. My character experienced fewer deaths since I started reliably using fury attacks. But blocking is not the only way to generate adrenaline, using regular attacks can do that as well. Regular attacks are simplistic, but they still contain a hidden combo mechanic that I have to shine some light upon. Basically, your first attack counts as the opener in the combo. Every attack after that will be slightly faster, further enhanced by the swiftness potion. I like the fact that when you first attack an enemy, your character will close the gap with this lunging motion. But unless your target is focusing on your companions, you won't be able to chain too many attacks because you'll have to interrupt your combo with dodges and parries. As I've said, mashing the attack button doesn't help because your enemies can easily block your attacks and you'll be left open. It's best if you do that to them instead. Parry, and while they're unbalanced, strike. I've also noticed that a counterattack which immediately follows a parry is a combo strike as well. You don't need to sit like a turtle and wait for them to attack, so get offensive if they take their time. You may also use an alternate melee attack. For the one-handed weapons, this is a kick that unbalances regular foes. If done right after you unbalance an enemy with a parry, it can knock down your target. By the way, keeping your eyes on a yellow bar as it fills up and then depletes isn't very exciting, so the developers also put this sweet lightning effect on your hands to indicate that your character is getting furious. One more thing, if you started attacking and you see your enemy also started attacking, your weapons clash and you will have blocked each other's attacks. But know that you are not locked in the attack animation and you can always cancel your strikes by blocking, dodging or rolling, so you should always prioritize defense. When you fight you must also learn to manage your targets. Only lock onto an enemy if you have the space and you know you can quickly take him out. But if your companions have fallen and you're swarmed, it's best to unlock from targets and simply try to parry their attacks. Scrolling up or down will change your targets if you insist on being locked on. Now that we're mostly done with combat, allow me to briefly talk about stealth. Unfortunately, sneaking in this game is very simplistic. You press C to crouch and as you move like that, you're stealthy. If you get close to a group of enemies, you'll see this eye indicator fill up. 
When it's yellow, they're suspicious, and when it's red, they're preparing to engage. If you weren't spotted yet, you can back away and they won't even know you're there. If you spot a group of hostiles and you think there's too many of them to handle, you can always try to sneak up on one of them and eliminate them with a stealth attack. The backstab kills most regular enemies in one hit, and taking one out can turn the fight in your favor. One thing I discovered about stealth is that if you're not spotted, your companions are not going to be seen either, even in plain view of the enemy. They must have mastered the art of moving so incredibly slowly that they've become invisible to the naked eye. You may also use bushes and tall grass to conceal yourself from enemies, and you can use this knowledge to avoid some fights completely by stealthily eliminating all enemies in an area before they have even the slightest idea what's going on. One last tip I have to share with you is this. Take care of your companions and offer them the best gear you can. Regular enemies can be eliminated without breaking a sweat, but for a boss fight you're going to need your companions in top shape, and you'll have to use the full extent of your abilities and the best gear available if you want to actually win the fight. If you can afford it, you should purchase weapons that exploit a boss's weakness, and you should also craft a lot of resurrection powder, because no matter how well geared your followers are, their dumb aggression will lead to them falling in battle to enemy area attacks which can easily be avoided. Once both companions are down and you're on your own, you can use this resurrection powder to instantly replenish their health and extend their usefulness. The damage they deal can be of great help in speeding up a guardian's demise, and if the boss starts focusing on your companion you can attack it from behind, dealing heavy damage if you have the proper skills. With all that said, I have no more things to teach you about combat. I did say that I will not go in depth, but I actually kinda did. Because all these combat mechanics are interlinked and you can't talk about one thing without mentioning all the other factors. The information presented today is far from complete, but it should be enough to help you triumph against all who stand in your way. Hopefully that's not too many people, since you're here as a diplomat after all. You're here to prevent a war, not start it. But if you do start it, your combat skills will keep it short. Anyway, thanks for watching and I hope to see you all in my next video or livestream. Until then, be good.